Good morning, welcome to the Develop Talent Driver Group. You are in the right room, and some of you, I'm sure, decided to come over here because you were so excited about the sessions, even though you signed up for Build a Smarter Infrastructure, right? Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Welcome. The first thing I'm going to ask you to do is please move forward. We're going to be doing a lot of inter... I know you've all got settled. I know you've set up your stations. Yeah. I would like to be full from the front because we've got a lot of group interactions. Stop scowling at me, Steve. We've got a lot of group interactions going on today where we're going to be putting you together. And if you're splattered all over the place, you're not moving. People from the back, come forward, please. Everybody, stand up or in the back rows and fill from the front. Come on, we're limited time. Let's go, 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 go. It's not like a funeral. It's good. I can hear you. <laughs> Mr. Ledge, Mrs. Ebanks, please come to the front. Hmm? Tasha, keep moving, keep moving. Michelle, keep moving. Forward, forward. Okay. Heather, you can stay where you are. You're fine, you're fine. <laughs> Okay, welcome everybody. So before I start, before I hand over to our first lineup of panelists and to Mary Rodriguez to um, introduce them, I've got a quick set of rules. And anybody who's worked with me before knows that when I put the rules out there, we are going to be sticking to the rules. So listen carefully. You can make notes. We have a very tight, packed agenda today. We've got a lot of great speakers coming up here. We want a lot of interaction from you guys. There will be Q&A. There will be round table or parallel square table discussions. Um, so we're, we're going to be very tight on our time frames. And to enable us to be very tight on those time frames, we've got to be strict. So here are the rules. Are you ready? Where am I? Panelists, you will be guided by our time frames. Mary and I will alternate in terms of who is leading the discussion and who is supporting. Whoever's supporting will be giving you the time out um, or the move on and to keep you on track. So be aware. Um, the same for the groups when we go into our group discussions. We'll be very strict on our time frames. The slides will be posted to the website after the event, so don't worry about taking too many notes on that. During question and answer sessions, please raise your hand if you have a question, and one of our support team will come around and make sure you get a microphone. What we ask is that you ask a question. We have limited time, as I said. We don't want statements made, or as much as you've all got very interesting stories to tell, we want questions, uh, not statements. Um, so please, when you raise your hand, target the question related to the point. If we go off topic, and I'm sure there will be differing of views and opinions, and we'll get into all sorts of great discussions, I'm going to park them for discussion at coffee breaks, lunches, and cocktail re reception, because that's where we can have some great debate great discussions and, and take this forward. But if I sense that we're getting off topic, I'll pull us back in and put us on topic. We will have differing and opposing views. Please be nice to each other. And then uh, on your roundtable sessions, you'll be given time for roundtable discussions. We will ask you to nominate a writer. We'll ask you to nominate a speaker. And as the wrap up for each of the panels, the, each speaker will give us feedback on what you have come up with. We urge you, please, to not only state what you think the issues and problems are, but some potential solutions, because we are a solutions-focused group today. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to my co-chair, Mary Rodriguez, and the first panel. Thank you very much, Samantha. And welcome again, everyone. And a special welcome to our first panel for, the day, for today. And they're focusing on ensuring successful educational performance. That's a topic. And we've asked them, they're all representatives from the ministry, and they'll introduce themselves shortly. But we've, we've asked them to share with you some of the successes to date, um, what are so, some of the next steps, and also some opportunities for collaboration. So if I can start with you, Michael, would you please introduce yourself? Um, my name is Michael Miles. I work for the Minister of Education in the capacity of Program Coordinator for at -risk Children. Um, I'm Jo Wood, and I'm Chief Policy Advisor for Education. 
and I'm Julie Matchwick. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor for Early Childhood Care and Education. Okay, where everybody's hearing, everyone okay? Good. Okay, so we have a PowerPoint presentation and, and yeah. I'll ask the panel members to, to <coughs> make a start. Okay, and I think we've got a job for Samantha as a teacher managing behaviour in yes, schools, yeah. right? Oh. <laughs> you are a former teacher. <laughs> okay, um, anyway, welcome everyone, and we're delighted that you joined us, whether you're from the public or private sector. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of an overview of the reform programme that's been mentioned already, and then we'll home in on two specific initiatives that contribute to um, the reform of education in Cayman. Um, we, we link it to the theme of today because of the importance of investing in children and young people for the future. And most um, countries at the moment are emphasizing um, the importance of education in their systems to improve, to kickstart or um, improve their economies. It doesn't matter if it's Southern Sudan, the newest country in the world, or if it's one, one of the most developed countries. Those who can invest the most, most for instance, um, the UAE, or as much as they possibly can, which is very little, they're all intent on reform through education programs. And we are in the midst of a huge and aggressive education reform program, and there's been significant investment in that reform program, and it's a big change, and there's a lot of change to manage. Um, we've Today, we, we hope to get signed off a strategic plan for the next five years for the Cayman Islands, for the government schools particularly. And what we're set about doing is to improve the quality of educational provision and raise standards. Why are standards so important? Because these are indicators of progress and success. I just want to share with you some of the progress that we've made through the reform programme very recently. So if you have a look at this, you'll see that between 2000 and 2000, 2007 and 2012, we've almost doubled the number of students, the percentage, I'm sorry, the percentage of students who've attained um, five or more uh, level two qualifications. That's either GCSE, CXE or equivalent. So that's the sort of standard. It's the same standard that they use in the UK. So that's almost doubled. And um, we're very, very pleased with that. And particularly because we've gone from 38% um, to 49.4% in the last three years, which is uh, an increase of 11%. And that's good. As well as that, I'm not sure if you can see them very well, but I've put there for you the improvements in primary, the end of primary English and maths. And in English, in 2011, 33% um, of the primary, end of primary age children um, achieved the national expectation. And this year that was increased to 50%. Again, that's been a big leap and due to a literacy intervention. Um, in maths, we've increased from 25% to 42%, so we're really, really pleased with that. We do know from the data that we have that there, there are differences between the attainment of boys and girls, and that's something that we're ad addressing. As I said, we, we set about an improvement journey, which started in 2009, when we uh, undertook an audit of the system. Um, there was a major consultation and analysis of what the issues were, what are the key drivers that we needed to tackle to ensure that we improved. We launched the uh, stabilisation plan in 2011. Uh, we implemented it um, between the end of 2010 and December 2012. We, we, we're still finishing that off now. 
um, we undertook the performance um, review over a period of time so we analysed performance data, talked to students, talked to teachers, parents and other stakeholders and what they thought that the issues were qualitatively as well as the quantitative um, data that we had. And as I said, um, today we hope to sign off our five-year strategic plan with a, an official launch on Monday. We know that the strategic plan is only the start of the next stage of the journey. The implementation and the impact of that strategic plan are what we're really, really looking for because um, if it doesn't have impact, then it is pretty worthless. How will we know that um, the plan and all the work that we do will make a difference? One of the first things that we undertook was to make sure that we had robust data to inform um, the planning, um, the benchmarking, the targets that we're going to set for ourselves so that we can track progress and track the journey. We've got um, a significant amount of data now, not just for literacy and numeracy, but at uh, individual student level, class level, year group level, school level, national level, um, in a number of different areas, so we can actually make some comparisons. And so that teachers at classroom level can use um, the data to ensure that each student, each child makes progress. Um, we've restructured secondary education and part of that restructuring has involved the setup of SIFEC, Cayman Islands Further Education um, College. And we want to um, point you to, to that particular initiative and there will be um, a presentation by them um, later on. We think that that's been an important initiative in, sh in terms of making sure that young people are prepared for the workforce. We've had literacy and numeracy strategies, professional standards set for teachers so that no matter what part of the world they're from, from New Zealand, from the UK, from the Jamaica, or from within the Cayman Islands, everybody is working to the same um, set of standards. And linked to that, we've got a new performance management system. Um, my two colleagues here are going to home in on, drill down on two specific initiatives. One of them is BEST, which is working with at-risk students, which Michael will go into, and the earlier strategy that Julie will go into. Um, we've got people here today from both private and public sectors, and I have worked um, in past um, roles in past projects where there have been really, really strong partnerships established between public and private sector. And I know how well that can work, how effective it, will be, it can be. In terms of um, the, the architecture of that, it's really important that that's set up to uh, ensure that our objectives, our mutual objectives are met. And we can ensure that the projects that we craft do meet business, your business objectives as well as our own objectives. Um, I'll just mention one particular um, uh, project I, was, I have been involved in where I worked with um, Kellogg's. Kellogg's breakfast cereals and they um, sponsored breakfast clubs for some of our poorest schools in um, in areas in the UK and they were really really important those breakfast clubs because it meant that children who came to school without a breakfast and a good start to the day were supported um, by business and then K Kellogg's could um, use that for their marketing in terms of their um, social responsibility program which was linked to the business excellence model. So um, at the moment we do have some specific projects. Businesses in Cayman are involved in supporting our students from SIFEC and from um, UCCI with work placements, apprenticeships, CISPA and LIFE. LIFE is a new organisation that's been set up um, to, we, by various groups um, in Cayman and they do have, they're very, very committed to social responsibility. They're supporting literacy and numeracy projects. We have various um, businesses who are 
sponsoring scholarships for young people and also we've had significant support for the after school uh, program. Um, we've got lots and lots of ideas for potential partnerships with the business sector. I've just mentioned three of them here. Um, potentially support for a not-for-profit earlier centre. Um, team challenges, I've done a lot of team challenges working with business businesses, particularly with their HR departments, where teams from business businesses actually get involved in challenges working with schools. Um, it might be making a new playground, it might be just painting walls, it might be a reading program, but they, they are great for building up y your own team in your own business. And also, um, one of the big gaps we have at the moment uh, here is adult education. We don't have a substantial adult education programme. And, you know, we, we really want to kickstart that. And we'd really like to um, look for partnership with, with the private sector on that. Um, that was a quick overview, pretty fast. I'm going to hand over to Michael now so he can tell you about the best programme. Hello again. Um, I need to get through this as quickly as possible and hopefully give you as much information uh, to walk away from this. Um, I would encourage you that, that I certainly have a lot more information and I'd like to chat with anyone afterwards just to give you a bit more detail. But I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as possible. So Best, you've got six minutes, Michael. You're all right. <laughs> BEST, it, be, the, the acronym BEST stands for Behaviour and Education Support Team. Two and a half years ago, uh, when I was brought into the ministry, we felt that we needed to tackle our most vulnerable children because they were quickly becoming our problems later in the future. And, and I'm sure that many of you guys who worked within the system or read the newspaper, watch TV, understand the magnitude that some of, some of our most vulnerable children are having within our country. I will tell you as a former social worker, as a former manager of a children's home, there is significant impacts. And we created BEST to ensure that we can start off providing interventions as quickly as possible. Some of the challenges that we face in our system with at-risk kids are that by the time we, have, we recognize them, they're 14 and 15 years old, and a number of the issues has been exasperated. Um, another challenge is that they are, many of them are coming in contact with the police or the juvenile justice system too quickly and too often. Another big challenge is that it's costing us a lot of money to incarcerate a number of our young people today. It's costing us at Northwood Prison over $60,000. In the children's homes, it's costing us double that. So that's is now working towards interventions as quickly as possible. We've went through an identification process in all of our schools, which means that we now know an all, pretty much the majority, of, if not all of our most vulnerable children, and this is topping over 500. Now, it's not an alarming figure to us because a lot of the challenges with these kids are not you know, have, have not just been exasperated. That's why we want to start off as early as possible. The BEST team incorporates a number of these departments and agencies. We know that if we don't start working together, sharing information, sharing resources, we're not going to make this. Folks, this is not an education problem. Certainly not a private sector problem. It's our problem. It's a Cayman problem. And our job right now is to partner as much as we possibly can to tackle the issues, and that's what we're doing. Before I get on to the after-school program, I just want to tell you what the partnerships have brought in terms of success. Because of the success that we've had from September of 2011 um, till June of 2012, we best have serviced over 400 plus kids. Now. The advocacy that we do within BEST is ensuring that the children that need school lunches get them, children that need breakfast programs get them, children that need health services um, get that, from vision care to extended after school programs to mental health um, services, all of these things are advocated 
through BEST. And BEST is a team of people, of educators, of uh, police officers, social workers, um, of folks that are um, counselors. It's all of us, and we meet once a month and discuss our most vulnerable children and ensure that they get the resources. What came out of BEST was we needed resources, because BEST is advocacy, but we needed a bigger resource. And one of the most profound resources that was advocated strongly on is the extended after school program. This program started off in April of 2011 from a dream that Ms. Rodriguez, myself, and the minister had to protect a larger volume of children, that most of them are at risk. The program started off with about 60 kids at John Gray Clifton Hunter. 10, 10 activities, one program manager. When we launched the program again as a full-fledged program in September 2011 with 25 activities, we had 900 kids at John Gray and Clifton Hunter in SciFact. Huge success. And all we did was provide them with the activities that they advocated strongly on. We weren't done. We knew that we needed to ensure that our primary school, because that's most of our most vulnerable, are there. To date, this program have over 1,400 kids in it. We provide every form of activity. We're now looking at, well, we've actually implemented counseling programs. We, we were implementing uh, um, parenting programs. In our primary schools, we feed over 400 kids per day. That is something that's unheard of. Now, challenges to this, funding, and I am here really to appeal as well, other than providing information, is to ensure that I can partner with everyone in this room to ensure that we don't lose this program. If we don't get this, and again, our government have provided significant amount, and we also have a number of sponsors who've also provided funding, but we need funding to sustain this long term. So Michael, I'm going to ask you to network with these good people at coffee and lunch, sure. hand out your card, and be prepared. Sure. Yep. Program overall is doing quite well, and we're happy with the progress that we're making with many of our young people. Um, again, we have numerous amounts of things to inform you about. We have a booth over there, so I'd like to share some more of that stuff with you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. On to you, Julie. Okay. Um, so, a photograph there of some children in Georgetown reception. I think day two, uh, doing some exploring. And as Albert Einstein says, play is the highest form of, of research. And these young men were very much exploring and chatting while they were doing it. So, it was a lovely photograph. Um, we, we began, uh, the unit began in May 2011, about 18 months ago. And right from the start, we set a strategic direction. We set ourselves some goals. And although we've refined those and we've, re we've put details and action plans to be responsive to our community, we haven't changed what we set out to do, and that is to provide access to high quality early childhood care and education for all children, regardless of income, background, special or additional education need. I'm just going to run through our strategic goals and uh, let you know what the progress is so far. Um, strategic goal one, uh, legislation and policies. We actually have uh, just uh, prepared a bill to amend the education law to include early childhood education to ensure that we can have regulations uh, to support quality improvement, um, to ensure that uh, we can support people, to uh, the centre owners, to make policy within their centre and, and keep within the law. We've revamped the Early Child Assistance Program funding so more children can access that and it's, uh, um, that's been strengthened and streamlined. Import most importantly, and Michael's probably touched a little bit on this, if we don't get the parents on board, we can't do anything. So one of our major focuses is with our parents and our families. We run workshops for parents in early childhood centres. We have a captive audience. They want to talk to us. They want to be there because they want the best for their children. And in the early years, it's the best place to start for that. Right? Okay. 
Um, uh, we have, a, it's not just a small group of us, there's, there's four or five of us in the team. Uh, there's also the, our partners in the community, our centre owners, and uh, we, we, we're a small team within the greater team. We work alongside them, we consult with them, and we visit and support. And our main function is to support our early childhood uh, care and education centres. And to do that, we train teachers. We take the early childhood care and, um, practitioners. We have run a six week course that uh, had a 99% uh, success rate. And that was after hours, after they'd finished a day's work, um, and it was unpaid. They weren't paid to do this. We had 118 participants from 23 different centres and the impact of that has been quite huge. We're in the process of developing something now that's um, going to take, to be an extension of that. Um, we uh, have prepared the early childhood, uh, early years curriculum framework. It's sitting over there on the table amongst some other information. We drafted it uh, in September. We delivered it in December. It's being piloted and implemented at the moment and we have, have uh, completed a comprehensive training package for centre owners and for their staff so they, to support them to, uh, to implement. Plus we've actually worked with them in their centres as well. Um, and of course uh, transitions between home and school very, very important. Uh, there's been, the reception program has been increased uh, within, the, within the primary schools and uh, we've established a transition class for those children who just need a little bit of extra support. And again, we need funding, we need help and support small team uh, together and we have sat down and we set a direction and we, we set some goals for ourselves. Some of those are to set up a resources centre at the library so the centre owners can go in there and check out resources, high quality ones that they can use and then return and share. Um, we have an adopt a centre programme so our community centres that work in our very toughest communities can get some support. For example, um, with building outside areas for children to play. Um, I think that's about it. Next one? Yes. And this is a page from our curriculum. I want you to read it and I want you to put your hand up if you think that's the sort of people we want in our community. Hands up. Very good. Yeah, that's what we're working towards. Thank it, you very much to our panellists. Can you give them a round of applause for you? They've been awesome, not only for the content of what they've said, but amazingly they've kept her time free. And you know, as Chief Officer, I think I have the best job possible in the world, because we get to work on things, initiatives that make a difference in, in, in people's lives and help every child to succeed. And, and, and through our panelists' presentations, we've touched on just a few of them. But also the most wonderful thing is getting an opportunity to work with such talented, passionate um, team members here today. So I'm very proud of you guys, so thank you. Um, you you've heard some highlights um, of some of the activities, initiatives that are involved, um, some of the successes, but also thrown out to you many challenges and opportunities for how um, partnerships um, can, can be arrived at. So we're not going to let you out of the room um, before the end of this day unless we have some people signing up and saying we want to be a part of what you're doing. We want to help um, move things forward. But not question time. Um, just find if any of you have any questions. Maybe it's about the reform process. Um, you might have questions about some of the things you've heard about. Maybe some of the initiatives. Maybe questions about a, um, some of the potential partnership opportunities that I've mentioned or your own ideas. So. You've sat, you've heard, any questions for the panel? Hi. If you could just say your name um, and, and where, where you're from and then, and then your question, please. Juliette Defoe from Dart Enterprises. Oh, Welcome. <laughs> Hi, We're good live. morning. Morning, panelists. Hi. Good morning. Thank you. I'm going to try and make sure that my teeth don't chatter, but I'm Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, yes, I am from DART, and um, you know, I've certainly been um, in touch um, with a few folks, but Michael, happy to chat with you afterwards, just in terms of some partnership opportunities. 
Um, my questions are really not from my professional um, experience, but from my personal experiences um, recently. And yet I think one of the challenges in dealing with um, education and some of the challenges that we have within our community really stems around creating awareness and just interest in getting involved and, and helping out. And I must admit that, you know, until recently I, I sort of wasn't aware of a lot of the, um, you know, real, real challenges that we have. Sort of the, what I see, just based again on my own personal experiences, um, is that we have significant gaps in some areas, and I know it sounds as if, you know, you all are trying to, to address those gaps. Um, but I just have a couple of questions, and one is, you know, just dealing with particularly um, young children at risk um, in those early childhood years. From my own experiences, there are significant resource gaps, um, specifically in terms of, you know, working with the partnering with health initiatives, um, some of the counseling, um, you know, resources that are required. Just one of the examples that I have was um, there was a young lady who um, her child was in foster care and a part of sort of her re uh, rehabilitation in order to get her child back um, was to attend parenting classes and she started to do that but then the resource that was assigned to that program left the government and then there were no parenting classes you know, available. And that's just one example and I realize that my experience is very limited. But just asking, you know, are there any plans in place um, to address those gaps? You know, another one that, that um, I've become, of, become aware of just recently is that as far as I'm aware, we have no child psychiatrists um, within our health system no. here. And that's one of the, the sort of needs that I think has been identified in a number of different cases. So just asking, you know, are there any plans in place to address those things? Are you partnering with sort of the health services to identify resources? Just wanting to know in general, like, are some of those things All right. well, thank, thank on the thank radar? You. Yes, uh, we, we only have a very limited time for questions, and I don't want Samantha to grab, jump all over. I was close. She was very, I was very close. She was very close. <laughs> so a question thank about you. resources in the area of uh, early childhood education, but children with, with needs. And I, I, I think with Julie this might want to mention, both, Michael yeah. may have something to say as well. Uh, it's interesting you should say that there's no parenting classes. I was actu actually at the Family Resource Centre about a week and a half ago, and they were running parenting classes there. So there are parenting classes out in the community. Um, the, the unit has established a blog with information for parents um, and, and it's interactive, parents can ask questions through that. Plus there's a lot of parent education going on on a wider scale out in the community. One of the things that the unit is wanting to do is partner to make multidisciplinary um, partnerships within the government and outside the government to support those, uh, those uh, parenting classes and also it's our strategic goal six in the plan and so we've got quite a few um, uh, actions to go under that so when you see the strategic plan look at strategic goal six and it should show you what we're wanting to do. EIP, Julie, could EIP. You just mention uh, the early intervention, intervention yes. program because government does invest quite a number of uh -huh. resources and there are partnerships because yeah. I think that was some of the issues we were being Yes, early about. intervention program uh, operates uh, and they've, they're now um, out in the community assessing children in the early years, providing programs of support for them. There's uh, speech language therapy, there's um, uh, play therapy, there's a lot of uh, music therapy. Um, so there are yeah, it's, it's a multi-agency multi approach, approach. Yes. and they refer children as well so if they see there's a child that they can't meet the needs of they refer them to another place okay well. we also just appointed mr brent holt mm -hmm. who is the head of uh who is our policy advisor on special needs so if you have further questions specific about mm -hmm. what are the range of resources and how we partner with other agencies we can talk to him michael just quickly a few words on the at-risk component children being identified at the very early stages and, and, and how, how is the system helping and then we must move on. Um, I, uh, as I've said before, one of the things that we're trying to do a lot quicker, especially from a primary school um, early intervention level, is make sure that where the interventions stop at Julie's level, <coughs> that I can get those interventions mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. Yes, there are gaps. We need more mental health experts. Um, we're partnering with HSA now to see 
where that funding is going to come from. We need a mental. We, we need several mental health experts as psychiatrists. That's a major gap for us. We need more psychologists um, as well. We are also partnering with mental health and using a number of our ed sites to help them streamline some of that. So that's a significant gap. Um, we also need more folks um, to assist with things like lunch programs, um, breakfast programs. Those are major gaps for us. Um, as well, aftercare is also a major gap. So, again, yes, there are significant gaps, but we are uh, trying to address them with hopefully more private sector uh, participation. Okay. Two hands actually. Real concerns, progress, still more to go. Two hands went up. So, if there's still a question, Steve, down here, a quick question, please. Thank you. Yes, you're under duress now. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'm Steve McIntosh from CML. Um, I just had a quick question to follow up on something that Chris Duggan alluded to in the introduction this morning. You mentioned there was an increasing emphasis on sports and education. Could any of the panel members elaborate? Yes, we, are, um, we have developed partnerships not just with sports, but with also youth programs. One of the things that we've noticed that not, not every child is sport oriented. One of the main reasons why the, why the extended after school program has been successful is because we don't only have sports programs. We have a diverse amount of programs from dance to draw to, you know, to vocational programs, you know, to other um, uh, uh, diversity programs that we have on the island. And that's why we get the numbers that we get uh, because of those programs. We introduce a skateboard club uh, that we partner with RCIPS. And you know, that program started off with 10 kids and now have 150 kids in that program. And it's run by RCIPS as well. So it's because we wanted to shed more mentoring, more insight that RCIPS should not be demonized. So yeah, I mean, we, we, we're trying to get away from just offering just sports programs because we have loads of those already on, on island. But, but again, the other part is not also sports, not just for children who are necessarily going to be the star athletes, mm. but sports for children who want to Healthy play. living. Yes. Just Healthy participate. Living. Healthy those living. Sort of okay, we had another question. Another one over there. Hello? Yes. Okay. Uh, I have just two quick questions. The first one is regarding the first graph that you put out there. Between the highest rate of change was between 2008 and 2009 and was about 10%. Can you provide an explanation for that? Because the rest of it is small changes. The other thing is, do you have uh, any data on what is the achievement per subject, particularly science achievement, maths, English, separated, not just the level one or level two? Mm. Thank you. Well, um, yeah. We, we do have um, a lot of data which we don't have here at the moment and we can provide that. Um, the uh, improvement in science is less good than English and maths, but the specific, um, I think the, the data that you're referring to on the graph is the five or more uh, uh, GCSE passes at grades A to C. And um, we when we look at improvement, we look at it over time. The, the main thing to look at is the upward trend. We're actually anticipating an even more improvement in the coming year. And that's as a result of a number of things. Um, it's not just about improving teaching and learning, but the choice of the right examinations that students take and making sure that they make the right choices, the, the, the subjects that they want to do, that they're good at, and so on. So it's really quite complex. So we want to look at it over time. And in fact, we will get some changes on a year-on-year -year basis because each cohort is different. Um, you, you, it's not the same co cohort of students going through year on year, so we need to take that into account as well. I'd also and like to point out when you look at the, the length of this, yeah. yes, 2008 to 2010 was a 10% increase, mm. but then 2010 to 2012 was another 10% increase. Mm. 
and, and, and actually, as you, were, as you go through time, initially it's easier to make those improvements and the higher we climb, then the harder it gets to um, have year-on-year -year improvement. We do, we do know that and that's been demonstrated in a range of countries where you get um, a, a consistent increase in educational attainment. Thank you. I mean, just just also, um, you know, it's about preparations in school, but from a policy perspective, just to share with you quickly, one of the things we recognized in 2008-9 that actually started getting implemented were our target we knew for success had to be five or more uh, GCSEs or CXEs at level two, high level passes. But what we discovered when we looked at the data that very a, a, a great number of our students weren't even being entered for that number. So what, right from the get-go, they never had a shot. So it's, it's really looking, if you could put our children first, is looking at those things and, making, and taking advantage. So that's just one example of a policy initiative as well, as, as well as what's happening in the school that yeah. has also, we think, made a huge difference. I think it's important to add as well, this is very honest data. This data represents all of the students, not, some of the, not just the ones who took exams, all of the students and this is the only country in the whole of the Caribbean that publishes data on all of its students in the government sector. Yeah. Good, good point. Um, we had one other question. I don't think we're going to have time to come back. During the break. Yes. Hi, I'm, Asko. I'm from the International College, the International College, right? And uh, as you know, we are in the business of adult training and higher education and I paid attention to Dr. Joy's comment about the adult training programs that you are looking at and I suppose trying to develop as well. Would you have any specific examples of the programs that you have in mind and what kind of partnership yeah. I s opportunities uh, Actually, I identified that as a gap. I identified it as a gap that we know we need to address that we do have some broad plans, that it will depend on partnership work, um, but it's something that we know will make a big difference at the, you know, the older age group, ad young, young adults and older adults. Thank you. We're going to move into the square table discussions now. This is where we get you to do some work. <laughs> You've been wonderful with your questions, we must say. So we've got 15 minutes, um, 16 minutes before coffee break. So what we're going to do is ask you to turn around and make up bigger groups. Um, I think we probably need about eight to ten groups, so just sort of turn around and join up. Be friendly. We're, we're going to ask our panellists, we're going to ask our, just before you... Before you turn around, <laughs> don't turn around I am yet. Freezing. <laughs> Before you turn around, I want to direct your discussions uh, because we want some outcomes from these talks. And as I said in, the, in my introduction, here. we've got bright Everybody's, leaders in industry in this room, and we want your input. The panelists are going to come around and, and kind of talk to you about what you're talking about. But basically. I want a writer and a speaker for each group because in the last five minutes of the session we want your feedback on after hearing this what do you feel are the priorities that we need to take forward why do you think they're the priorities and I want at least one idea in terms of how they can be implemented Um, so, yes, if you can hand in your sheets to us. I challenge you, though, before we go to coffee, I'd like to hear from the two groups who think they've got the best idea in terms of priorities going forward. Okay. <laughs> we have one. Anybody one, want to let two. them challenge? Okay. Oh, two wow. groups. Please two share. Groups, please share. So, this... Okay, we kind of uh, talked around a lot of different issues. Um, I think one of one of the priority areas that we think are really assessment services for those, especially for those kids that are at the middle of the road, they get um, they get lost, they fall through the cracks. Um, we believe that there's a lot of kids that they're really good kids, and they may have a learning difference, or uh, you know they're struggling. Maybe they're good C students, but there's programs for the kids that you know are the the, the real at risk. Um, there's great programs for the high flyers and the mentoring program, and it's been going on for a number of uh, many many years. But the the straight good kids that are middle of the road, they do tend to fall from the cracks, and they're the ones that end up being on the streets at the end of the day as well. Um, so we'd like to see some sort of assessment services for them. 
And at the same time, then, I think the biggest issue uh, for all of us when we were sitting and talking in the group is there's lots of things that have come and gone in terms of funding, in terms of partnerships. Um, we've personally experienced from an organizational perspective, and it is the follow through, the consistency, the commitment, and the collaboration on both sides. But we have found and we've been challenged um, numerous occasions in getting the ministry in particular involved in, in initiatives that we've taken. So it is to really um, hone in on the consistency, commitment, and the collaboration of, of both groups. Thank you. Thank you. This group down the front here. Now, now the challenge is, can you top that, right? Because it's supposed <laughs> to be a competition, it seems. <laughs> so one of the things we talked about, we had a couple of um, parents of young kids in our groups, and the first thing that we identified was the importance of developmental milestones in early childhood. Um, I was talking about personally how inspired I've been by my daughter's progress at CIS, who's now five, and is, is reading incredibly well, much better than I ever did when I was 12. And um, I wondered whether... They're laughing at you. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> uh, but I wondered whether there were um, any sort of developmental milestones that the government puts out there so that parents of uh, young children know that their kids are developing at the right, or that they're meeting the educational um, developmental milestones in early childhood. And obviously that's very important just not to leave any kids behind. The other thing that we talked about was the importance of diet and exercise, another subject close to my heart, though you may not know to look at me. Um, very important, I said, for education, discipline, and parental sanity in the home. Uh, and the, the ideas, specific ideas we had were, again, to issue um, diet and exercise guidelines so that parents knew what those were in early childhood specifically and the benefits of um, having a good diet and making sure that your kids get the right amount of exercise each day and um, also to extend early childhood regulations and training to uh, include diet and exercise mm -hmm. if they don't already. I was horrified to discover that, I hate to pick on CIS but it's where my kids go, that they only do PE twice a week mm -hmm. in early childhood and why not every day? It's, it's, not an, an, it's not an option. The human beings should exercise every day, in my opinion, and they should have a good diet. Okay, thank you very much. And um, of course, you have lots of resource people during the breaks that you can um, dialogue on these points, but please make sure. Is there anyone dying to share something, or, or, or you're all dying for coffee? You're dying to share, so you're going to wait a little bit longer for the coffee. I'll yes, Fred? I'll be, I'll be concise. Um, Actually, we mirrored some of the things about that middle, middle group, the high flyers versus the middle group and the need for funding. Uh, in terms of immigration, when the private, uh, private sector brings in employees, and, uh, really a lot of that scholarship money shouldn't be just set for lawyers and accountants, but also mm -hmm. should be really set for the middle and really to pool that money and, and look at that. the group of, of young people that need to be plumbers and electricians, mm -hmm. and masons and all that. So I think. That was a real important thing. And then the second thing was in terms of parent engagement. Um, there are parenting classes, but they don't go out to the east end or the north side. Or, and I think it, the same with uh, counseling, um, that a lot of the community-based work isn't happening out in the out of outer districts. It's more in town. That was one of the issues that was brought up. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you all very much. Um, you all have been fantastic. We can't wait to see what happens as the day goes on and you get to know each other and us a little bit better. But can I just ask you before you break for, before you go for your coffee break, can you, whoever has the reporting sheet, can you hold it up? We'll come and collect it. And then Samantha, when we need them back? We need you back promptly at 11.45. And the panelists, five minutes before to get mic'd up. Okay, so thank you. So hold sheets up, please, so we can get them collected before you go.